This is my seventh C++ now, and it's my favorite conference. So I'm like utterly jazzed to be able to like stand here and talk about stuff, and I hope it's of interest to you. Okay, so today I'm talking about preprocessor-aware refactoring. And what I'm going to do is, is first pitch refactoring, in case, you know, um, you're not already sold. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the tools that are out there to, to help us do refactoring when the preprocessor is getting in the way. First of all, some, some user level tools, some command line tools, and then some APIs that we have, namely uh, Boost Wave and uh, Clang's lib tooling uh, infrastructure. Um, as, a, as a sort of test case, we'll look at conditional compilation and all the problems with that, how we can apply those APIs to handling the, the complexities that the preprocessor's conditional compilation introduces um, with a couple of examples, and then I'll just wrap up. So first of all, uh, why should we care about refactoring? Well, um, refactoring is, is kind of, most code is, is legacy code, and so uh, most practitioners are dealing with a big pile of old code, and old code, um, is usually you can't really rewrite things. You usually have to sort of incrementally improve them. Um, and, they, and they get kind of crufty over time for all of these reasons. Um, and uh, doing a clean rewrite is very appealing, but it usually means uh, additional risk. And uh, risk means cost. So, um, and it's hard too to do refactoring. Um, we have to think like the author. There's sometimes no tests. Sometimes we have to refactor it just to be able to add tests. Um, the good news is that doing this well, because it's so important, um, and because most code is like this, um, it may actually be more important than writing very clever new code. So I think refactoring is really important, and tools to do refactoring are important. But um, one of the things that gets, us, that gets in the way of doing that is the preprocessor, because um, in a number of different ways. First of all, macro substitution is just like this big sort of string thing. It's untyped, or it's sort of, it's sort of stringly typed. Um, conditional compilation hides part of the code uh, at compile time. And also, generally, what, what we as programmers see when we're looking at the code, we see all of the conditional constructs. We see the full, the original program text. But what the compiler and most tools see is the preprocessed version of the text. And as a result, um, what the tools are doing for us, especially when they're trying to do some automated refactoring for us, is, is not the same thing as the thing that we see. Um, and so that's a problem. So here's one of the ways in which the preprocessor gets in the way. Um, it's a source of legacy idioms like constants, um, uh, um, function, function tile macros that, that do helpful things. Um, they can produce reproducible build issues. Uh, the Debian project is trying to make sure that um, they're, they're trying to compile all their packages in such a way that if you compile it and they compiled it, you can get a checksum and make sure that they're the same thing, which is good for security. Um, there's all kinds of uh, um, preprocessor usage that, that can produce a binary different um, uh, binary every time you compile. Um, Macro substitution can be uh, a barrier to refactoring when you're trying to do things like, um, for example, replace zeros with null putter. Um, there's a famous blog entry that came out recently about this. Um, if you're trying to, in this case here, we have something called zero, which is defined as zero. And sometimes it's used as actually zero, and sometimes it's used as a null pointer. And it can be difficult to decide, in this case, whether you want to change the zero to null putter, that would break this one, or I don't know, do something else. Um, so it, it 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 interferes with the with the process of actually trying to improve these these idioms in our code. Uh, conditional compilation is a big problem as well. Uh, you often hear, um, I've recently heard a lot about people saying, well, this tool or that tool would have detected heart bleed. Um, if if, the, if um, OpenSSL had been configured with this one particular um, macro defined, actually no one would have been able to, to detect heart bleed. So you could have had a difference in the configuration that the analysis was being run on and the configuration that everyone was using. And then you know, all of these, there would, there would have been 
you wouldn't have been able to find it with any of your tools. You could also have accidentally dead or, or, or unconditional code, even though it looks like it's conditional, um, just because of uh, problems in the way you've defined this stuff. There is a, a semi-famous problem in the Linux kernel. Um, when they first introduced the idea of CPU hot plugging, um, there was a spelling difference between the configuration option uh, when you build the kernel and the actual symbol that was being used inside the kernel modules. And it, that went on apparently for six months without anyone realizing what was wrong there. Um, they had just used a, a different label. Um, and finally, there's often better idioms um, maybe you should be using instead of conditional compilation. Sometimes you need it, but um, a lot of times, uh, especially since it's been around so long, um, we haven't been using it. Yes? Okay, sure, right. Um, that, that covers a lot of things. Um, uh, so a lot of the, ref like one, the one refactoring that I pointed to earliest was, sorry, um, Dave's question is, um, can I define refactoring? And uh, so I kind of think of it two ways. There's a lot of these sort of um, very simple sort of refactorings. It's like change the name of this function everywhere it exists, change all zeros that are used with pointers to null putter. And then there's other ones where it's kind of like a little bit more sophisticated ones like change from, from this structure to a different design pattern or something like that. So it's a little bit nebulously defined. Okay, well then let me, let me lay this okay. definition Okay. Because all the things you just named are semantics preserving code transformations. Okay. I would say that at a, at a higher level, sorry, the question is, um, all the things I've named so far are semantic pr preserving transformations. And then the question is, um, am I talking about something different than that? And I would say that um, I, some of the things I'm talking about might change the structure of the program, but at a higher level, they would have the same semantics. Like the program would function identically if you yeah. went, yes. I guess so. Okay. It might look different. Like you'd have a matrix algorithm instead of a graph algorithm. But sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So if you're dealing with a preprocessor, here's some user tools that are out there. Um, CPP to CXX. This is a really interesting one. Um, this is a great paper, by the way. I recommend reading it. Um, these are all ways of... Um, this is all tackling the problem of transforming um, macro usage into something a little bit more modern. So like um, either just straight macro transfer uh, expansion, say, of a constant or, a, um, or the name of a type. Um, or something like uh, where there's a function style macro, which um, actually results in an expression or something like that. Um, so for example, um, this is a type definition macro and they talk about how they would replace it. Um, you could have, this is a function style macro, and this is their suggestion for, for how to replace it and, and what their tool does. Um, it benefits from things like um, type deduction and other things that the macro didn't have. Um, their tool CPP to CXX is actually actively maintained and it uses both of the tools that um, I'm going to talk about today. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I would take a look. Uh, Clang has a bunch of tools. Um, the, there's, a, there's a version in Clang Tidy of the first problem that I described with that Scott Myers has and their take is their approach is to uh, not change the macro definition but to allow, other than null, to allow users to specify other, um, other macros that they, that they want to perform the substitution on. Uh, there's Clang Modularize. Um, that's really interesting because this is trying to help people trans, but trying to help people move to um, C++ modules, and it checks a lot of things about like uh, macro redefinitions and other stuff like that. It's so it's one of the, the things I found that does the most of kind of simultaneously looking at what's going on in the preprocessor and what's going on in the actual AST and and with the compiler. 
um, other tools. I threw CPP check in here because um, most tools I've seen just kind of punt on the problem of conditional compilation. CPP check actually tries to do something about it. Uh, this, this tool, if you ever run it, uh, if, you, if you have code that's, that's conditional, that's dependent on, on things that defined at compile time, uh, it will actually try to create every combination of them and, uh, and static check each one of those. Usually that uh, results in an explosion of configurations, but it actually tries to do it. It actually sort of thinks about that, which is, which is unusual. Um, there's a tool that's popular in, uh, in Linux land again called unifdef. Um, it's mainly used to strip away the stuff that's um, kernel only to produce uh, user uh, like system call interface files and things like that. But it's, it's analyzing it and it's, and it's doing stuff with it. So let's talk a little bit about APIs. There's two I want to talk about today. One is Boost Wave and the other is Clang's libtooling. Um, Boost Wave has been around for a little while. I think it, it went in to Boost um, about maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, it uses a lot of generic programming techniques like a lot of things in Boost. Um, it kind of decouples the lexer from the preprocessor. Um, it uses things like iterators. You know, you supply whatever iterator type you like and it operates on it. Um, the preprocessor can tell uh, uh, an observer when different things have happened through callbacks. It uses Spirit Classic. Um, I found online, I, I hadn't heard of this, I think before like a year ago, but um, it's actually, it, it's sort of a quietly popular language. I found that uh, these, these guys at um, Imageworks uh, used it on, um, on Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2, and Men in Black 3, and three other things that they listed in their, in their GitHub. So it's interesting to check out. And this is a more conventional use. These people are doing um, source transformation, like programming language research stuff. Um, here's how you would use it. Um, it supplies, here, here's how you would use the lexer level of it, I should say. Um, it supplies a token type and uh, an iterator and um, you can start with a, a string iterator, for example, and um, produce a token, a token iterator out of it. And then you can iterate over the tokens and just print them out or do whatever else. Um, I believe you can make spirit classic grammars out of it. Um, the preprocessor side. Oh, right. I was going to highlight the code. Then you can print it out. OK. Um, the preprocessor side is uh, just kind of wraps it. And um, it produces, there's this context object. And you, you can also get tokens out of that. So um, this, is, this is how you would set, set up a, a context object. And um, now you can, this, these are the hooks I was talking about, where when things happen in the preprocessor, you can get a callback. So, um, and that's going to be important. So, that's how you would do it. Um, and then, then the iterators that it supplies to you are actually um, the preprocessed ones. So sometimes they're the original tokens, but sometimes it's skip tokens because um, you're in conditional compilation and that part wasn't taken, or um, it's expanded, or things like that. So you get all of that information out of it. So sort of similar to the previous one, if you wanted to, you can simply just print all of them out. Um, it's got hooks as well, and I just picked a couple of examples. Um, these are those, those callbacks I was referring to. Um, every time it finds a directive uh, of in, any kind of preprocessor directive, it'll, it can call you. Um, there's one every time you, you have an if or an else if or a if def or something like that. Uh, again, you can, you can get a callback, um, and that's useful for a lot of stuff. Um, so here's how you would use it. Um, now let's talk about libtooling a bit. Any questions about Wave comments? No. Oh. Okay. Um, this is a, a really, really powerful um, set of tools. Um, 
they're, it's pretty different from Wave in that it's like a lot more sort of OO and all the different parts of it uh, talk to each other very kind of tightly. Um, and, um, but uh, the advantage is you get the, um, uh, you get access to, the, to all the AST tools and, um, and the ability to, to kind of like really get into the language. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of them, which I apologize for, but um, there's just so much there. Uh, there was a presentation here two years ago, which was good, and uh, probably a very relatively updated one was about six months ago at the LLVM dev meeting, and uh, it's about 30 minutes. It's a good, a good watch if you want to learn more about it. Uh, so very similar to Boost Wave, there is a callback. Um, class that you can um, derive from and, and put your own stuff in. Uh, it uses, the, the information it gives you is a bit different. Like every time you get, it doesn't say just there, I saw a directive, but it'll say I saw this particular kind. Um, and it'll also, it also thinks not in terms of tokens, but in terms of like uh, character source locations, which are basically character level ranges inside the source code. Um, which is sometimes good and sometimes bad. I found it harder to write a parser, for example, on top of, uh, on top of a, a character stream than I did on, on top of uh, a stream of tokens. So um, here's an example. It looks pretty similar, uh, except, as I said, they, instead of saying, I saw a directive, it says, I, have saw, I saw an if directive specifically, um, and gives you that in, that in the sort of character offset information. Uh, one thing I really love about this, though, is you see this here. So when you get the end if directive, when that happens, it actually tells you what the associated if was, which unfortunately wave doesn't do. And so there were things uh, when I did wave, I had to sort of sit there and count and like figure out where I was in the in the nesting. Um, but this will give you that directly and then you can just use it. Um, so the, the kind of the main API uh, offered to users is the refactoring tool. Um, you have matchers, which, are, are, uh, which find bits of the AST that are of interest to you. Um, you get a callback every time your matcher matches. Um, and you can output replacements, which then you can do, use to, to make edits to the source files. So it gives you hooks to gain control at the start of parsing every file and performing actions. And I use that to install preprocessor callbacks. Um, so matchers. Matchers help you find things in the AST. They're like a configurable, I'm probably using the wrong term here when I say visitor, but um, uh, you can mark nodes of interest for processing by callbacks. So, you, so your matcher says, I'm looking for this kind of structure. And when you see this one, mark it, bind it with this string. And you can ask about it later. There's three kinds of matchers. Um, nodes, there's all kinds of specific nodes in the AST corresponding to different structures in the code. Um, there is a narrowing matcher which says, like it has to have some characteristic, like the associated name has to be something or look like something or whatever. And finally, there's a traversal matcher, which is for things like, uh, in the AST I've reached a, a call site and I'm looking at an argument and I want to know what the associated parameter of the thing being called is. You know, and it can take you there, and then you can do constraints on that side. There's this tool called Clang Query, which when you're trying to figure out how to write matchers, you can bring up Clang Query. Um, and, and it's just interactive command line tool. Uh, finally, you can write custom matchers, which I had to do. Uh, so here's an example of a matcher for a move constructor. Um, you take your finder object, which is the thing you supply to refactoring tool, um, and, and this is, here we are adding it. Um, this, is, this is a node matcher. This looks for a constructor declaration. Um, there's a narrowing matcher right after it, um, which, which checks and makes sure that it's a move constructor and not some other kind of constructor. And then finally, I use this, this ability to mark um, by using the bind. Um, and then that can be used by this move constructor handler thing. And here's a handler example. Dave. So 
So presumably the AST that you get is corresponds to one particular way of evaluating the preprocessor uh, uh, directives, right? The question was, is is the the AST I get corresponds to one path through the con to, through the conditionals? Yes. So, um, so how do you deal with that? Yep, that's the problem I'm trying to solve. So, okay. I'll, I'll get to it in a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's exactly the question that I that launched me on this. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I mean, I guess it's not just conditionals because you have you have function style macros that can generate all kinds of code. And you can conditionally include things. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, for the for the audience online, we were complaining about the preprocessor. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so here's what my here's what I happened in a in a handler. Um, this git um, this is like a git as sort of thing, and you can um, take the you can look for that string that you bound earlier, and then you get back an AST node. In this case, a CXX constructor decal, um, and now I can. Now this is a direct access into the AST, and I can I can call all of the things that that this thing's um, methods provide. So, whoops. <laughs> in in this case, I just want to get the location and say, hey, I found a move constructor. Uh, pr the source manager is this other global object uh, provides this thing called is in main file, so you can filter out things that were in your included files, which is real helpful. Okay. So replacements, replacements are super simple. Um, they're they're basically just edits to a file that are described very simply. It's like um, uh, a position and then a length of whatever you're going to replace, and then the new data. So you can, with that, you can implement like um, inserts um, if there's if there's no data being replaced. Um, you can delete things if there's no new uh, string. <laughs> And finally, you can just replace stuff. And in fact, there's an overload for this where you can give an, a node in the AST and it'll figure out how big that is in the source file and just take that out and replace it with your code, whatever it is. So this is kind of awesome. Um, and this is just what it would look like when you build that tool. Uh, you define your refactoring tool. This is for option parsing. Um, this just allows you to run your tool kind of like it was a compiler. Um, so you can add defines on the command line. Um, and this is how it goes. So, yeah. Okay, so that's making tools with libtooling. All right, so what can we do with conditional compilation? Um, I've got a couple of examples that I wanted to try applying um, some of these APIs to. The first one is, if you think about uh, your input file, as, as a series of, um, of lines with um, conditional compilation directives in between them. You can associate with each block of lines a condition that describes under what circumstance that block of, of lines will be present in the output code. Um, so I propose that we should try to, figure, try to make a, a way to parse a file and produce this data structure. The second thing I was thinking is that we could take at least simple if def things and turn them into like policy classes. Again, I may not be using the right term, but to change that, take that difference in behavior and factor it out so that um, you sort of configure your class with, with a, like a policy class and then you just call the static methods from there or use the types from there. Um, and the, the user code is, is, uh, doesn't have any more conditionals. No problem. So that first bullet sounds like a technique for achieving something like the second bullet. Uh, I can't tell whether. So, I, in, so for, for me and, and the way I wrote it, they're somewhat different because, let's see. Okay. I mean, I don't know if you can solve the second one unless you can understand. Okay. Um, the, the question was, um, these two seem like the same thing. Um, and the first one, you need the f answer to the first to solve the second. Uh, let me think about that. I didn't use the answer to the first to solve the second, um, but l let me see. Uh, I'm trying, 
I'm trying to do a much simpler thing in the second one, but I'm trying to actually rewrite the code. In the first one, I'm trying to just get information. Uh, it may be that I could connect these two. I haven't thought about it. Okay. It could be. So how would we how would we calculate the presence conditions, um, or, or what what am I trying to do? Um, I'm trying to split the code. Um, things you could do with this, you could identify dead code. Um, there was uh, didn't mention this earlier, but one of the things that some of the researchers found in the Linux kernel was four different, um, four different sections in the kernel where it was actually not possible that that code would ever be present given the configuration file. Um, no, no, no combination of settings could produce that being present in the code. Um, you could also identify code that appears to be conditional but is actually, in fact, always present. Um, you could calculate a version of the source under different assumptions, like you could say, well, assuming the following is true, show me what the, what the output would look like. Um, and I mean, in this case, simplified, not simply preprocessed, but actually simplified. Um, and finally, you could enumerate all possible texts. If you look at something like CPP check, it has to say, well, uh, everything I test for defined on could either be defined or undefined. And the product of all of these things is the total number of things I have to consider. Um, but if, the, if there's overlapping conditions, that might not always be true. You might have some, some smaller number of actual possible texts. So here's the kind of thing I want, to come, I want to end up with. This is an extremely simple example here. I've got just one nested if inside and if in def. Um, I want a table that looks like this. Um, the, the condition under which the, the text is present and then the actual text that was there. So what would I need to do that? I would need um, a library that could represent conditional expressions, combine and simplify them. Um, I would need a lexical analyzer that handles C++ tokens. And finally, I would need a parser that could recognize um, program text and preprocessor conditionals um, for use with this other stuff. So for the first one, in my view, what we need is an SMT solver. Um, I'm not a big math person, but this is my description, hand-waving of what it does. Um, you have expressions, and you want to know whether any combination of the variables involved in the expression can make the expression true. Um, there is a thing called SAT. There still is a thing called SAT, which is more like Boolean. Um, but SMT introduces things like integers and floating point numbers and bit vectors and all this other stuff. So you can construct expressions, and then there's been a lot of investment in figuring out how to do this really quickly and how to take expressions and simplify them and, and, and find out if it's ever possible for them to be true, which would be useful in our dead code analysis. Uh, I picked one called CVC4. I'm not an expert on SMT solvers, but it worked pretty well. Um, this is how you use CVC4. Uh, you have to create an expression manager in an SMT engine. Um, you have to tell it, in this case, that we're going to use integers and booleans, and that's it. Um, you can define variables. And I'm going back to my example of the, of the page before here. We're going to have a boolean called A and an integer called C. And you can think of the boolean A as def is defined A rather than A. Uh, we construct an expression which is that expression that I showed on the previous page. Um, a is anded with C being uh, greater than 10. So that's how you make that, uh, that uh, expression. Um, and finally, let's see, if you want to simplify that expression, um, you can assume that something is true and say, well, what will happen to this, to this expression I had assuming that this other thing is true? For example, somebody says on the command line they define something. You can say, well, what happens to all of these expressions? Um, in this case, I assumed that C was 20. And so, whoops. And so, since, the, since my expression is defined A and C greater than 10, the C greater than 10 part just drops off and you end up with A. So that's the power of these kind of engines. Um, the second thing I needed was Alexer, so we actually have Boost Wave. Um, I haven't written a Spirit Classic grammar, and I decided that what I would do is uh, adapt the Boost Wave Lexer to work with Spirit V2, so then I could write a Spirit V2 
parser. So, and I, I don't think in, anyone will benefit from seeing that code. Uh, so, the way we have to operate is we've got all these nested ifs and if defs and all that stuff that can go down a really long way. And then at the end of it, you've got the, you've got the leaf node there and it's got some lines of text and there's a condition. And you want to know what is the condition under which this leaf node of block of text is going to be present. And it's going to be like the and of a lot of things all the way up, right, to the, to the top level. And furthermore, if you have something like if, else if, else if, it's, it also has to sort of have, you have to and in all of the, and not the other condition, and not the other condition, all that kind of stuff. And actually, I thought that spirit rules were a nice fit, as it turns out, for this task. So here's the anatomy of a spirit rule. I'll first describe this, um, this data type that I need. This is just that block with the condition. Um, so the spirit rule itself uh, starts with an iterator. Uh, in our case, it's actually going to be the, the adapted Lexer iterator. Uh, this is, now here we get to the cool part. This is the result of, of evaluating our, uh, our if def spirit rule. And the result of it is going to be a vector of these text sections with their conditions. And it's going to take in the, the expression representing whatever the parent of it was. Um, and then in, inside it can take that and and it and everything as needed. We have a white space. Um, finally, we've got to do, because of that whole business of like um, else if and all that kind of stuff, we need in the case of if def, we needed one local variable in order to sort of say and not the other condition. So that's a, it all just kind of fits. And, and if I write a grammar, um, the grammar produces its result recursively. And so I can cause it to create at the top level this thing I needed, this vector of, this vector of, of text blocks with their conditions. Uh, so I did that. Did I? Yeah, I looked at the grammar and I thought about putting it on a slide, but mm, sorry. I'll actually demo this, so hopefully that will make up for it. Um, so this is putting it all together. Um, I run the parser that I've created, uh, the grammar that I've created uh, over, the, over the tokens supplied by BoostWave and adapted. And finally, we use our SMT engine uh, to check and see if the condition was satisfiable. And this is going to be my dead code analyzer. Uh, if, the, if the condition is not satisfiable associated with a particular text block, then there's no circumstances under which that could be present in the output, and therefore it's dead code. And just to make it more readable, I call simplify on it, and that'll tend to make it a little bit more readable. It must be time for the demo. I've never done a demo before. <laughs> I hope this works. Okay, so here's my, oh my goodness, look at all of that. Why, where is my, where's the part where I call a cat? Thank you, there we go. I'm in the wrong directory. See, this is already, I knew I shouldn't have done a demo. Okay, so this is my, um, so this is my test program, extremely simple. Uh, we've got a couple of nested things. Um, the most interesting bit is probably here where um, I have like a slightly more complicated expression uh, if foo's not defined. Now foo's always defined actually because it's in here. So I'm trying to model like, oh, I messed something up, right? So, but um, this, this will never be true. Um, and so the real question is, uh, there's some circumstance this will be uh, dead code and, and in other circumstances it won't. So let me look for D, E, whoops, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so let's, let's imagine that, um, so I'm going to run my analyzer. It says I don't have any dead code. Um, so let's look and see if I supply an expression not shown in the code, but I, I also assume, if you supply another expression, I assume it's true and then run the analysis again. Oh, yay, it worked. In this case, 
And this is the, the SMT engine's idea of, of what my expression is, not foo defined or bar greater than or equal 11. Um, but so it, it did find that if I assume that, uh, that, that bar is less than 10, then not only is this one false, but this one is also false. So, um, and, then, and then we have dead code. So that's just the simplest thing you could do. Um, now that I have this data, um, I think you could do a lot more with it. But that's just what I thought I would do for a demo. All right. Did everyone buy that? OK. <laughs> All right, um, the last idea I want to talk about is using the API to do refactoring into policy classes. Um, so that would be something like this. Um, when you have usage where it's, uh, maybe you wanted to use um, a string from Qt, uh, you didn't want to use std string, or maybe you did or didn't, but you wanted it to be sort of conditionally compiled this way. Um, and you've got this stuff sprinkled everywhere, use QString constantly everywhere. Um, but the goal is you want to say, you know what, uh, everything associated with strings, I want to be supplied as a template parameter, and I'm just going to access stuff from this, this class that's passed in. Um, things like static functions, types, all that kind of stuff, so that, so that my new code can, can be a lot cleaner. So this is kind of what we want instead. Um, I don't know if this is the best idiom, but uh, uh, using QString is going to be this Boolean parameter to this, to this other class template. and uh, both variants of it are going to um, supply a type def for string t uh, and a two upper free function that you can call. Yes, Stephen. So, uh, I'm not sure if this is a really good idea. I know a lot of the time when I see if tests like that, if you, if you don't want to use the Q string grant, it's often true that Q string is not, it doesn't even exist with the link to still form. Stephen's comment is that if you, um, this will be ill-formed if QString doesn't exist at all. Uh, yeah, because then it won't compile. So maybe many times when people are using if def, they, uh, they actually don't have Qt at all or something like that. That's, that's, a, valid, that's a valid criticism. So may, yeah, maybe, maybe the specialization, maybe I need to arrange for the specialization not to appear or something like that, I don't know, yeah. Um, but you can see here I split it into, into a couple of, of variations on string class. And so then down here, so maybe I would put my specialization into one of these and then there would be no reference to QString at all. No, well I'd have to worry about the includes. Anyway, I'm not sure I didn't think about that. So the idea would be that, you would, that your usage would then come down to just one if def instead of them sprinkled all over the place. Um, and then later you would have something like this where you would just access all of this stuff from whatever the policy class was. Uh, the building blocks we need are a way to identify program and text associated with a particular if def, if in def, if, all that kind of stuff. A way to locate the text, um, the, this, this AST subtree associated with the text. Uh, a way to determine the variables that are accessed and modified by that text. Uh, and finally, code to integrate the above and, and produce edits. So we can identify conditional text using uh, our PP callbacks class. This is just me uh, taking the if def and, and storing the location of the, of the start so that I can reference it later when the end if tells me which if it's associated with. And here in the end if, I look it up and um, if this is one of the ones that we started looking at, then um, I'll do something like record, record that whole range. Uh, we don't have a way in, in Clang as it exists um, to identify bits of the, of the AST from a source range, uh, but we can make one because there is such a thing as a custom matcher. And in this case, it's pretty simple one. I just go and use the uh, the methods provide, provided for, for finding source locations from AST nodes. So I can, I can identify with a matcher in a, in a refactoring tool run uh, everything associated with, uh, with a conditional range. Um, let me make sure I got this right. Yeah, so I had a, a little bit of a trick, a little bit of a tricky problem here because 
I can get a callback whenever we start parsing a file and whenever we finish parsing a file, that's all the way through everything. Um, but I need to parse the file just enough to have the preprocessor run and identify the conditional ranges and, um, uh, and then actually create matchers that, that were like that. Um, and so there was no like well-published hook for that, but th there was a sort of slightly not quite published hook, which, which worked, so I used it. Um, so the, the other building block is analyzing variables um, and actually taking a, a section of text and trying to figure out what are the types, um, what are the, the variables and, and their types that are accessed within a, a series, uh, within a, a, a section of code, so that when I'm making this, this uh, static methods that I'm going to call that are in the policy class, that I, can, um, that I can know what their types are, so I can figure out what the parameters to the thing ought to be. Um, well, since we have the ability to rewrite source, and we have the ability to uh, run uh, compiler tools um, at will, basically, in memory on a string, um, what we can do is add lambda expressions around the, the, stuff, that, the, the stuff in the code and then run it Thank you. The question was, why am I doing this, uh, I think. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm just, it's a hack kind of, um, just trying to capture, uh, trying to get Clang to more easily tell me what's, what's being used inside the code. Uh, and so a sample result looks like this now. Uh, it doesn't completely work yet because <laughs> I'm actually able to capture all that stuff. I'm, I'm right at the end, I ran out of time I need to actually complete the rewriting of the static methods and sticking them in here. So what you'll see is the one, the one statement and the static methods aren't present. Um, I've moved the types over, so all that stuff looks right. I need to complete the work of doing the rewrite for the statements. But I, I am successfully figuring out what, what things are used by each, by each line of, by each statement area. Uh, and if you'd like to watch me finish that. It turns out there's this thing called an octothorpe, uh, which I'd never heard of, but that's the, uh, it's the hash symbol, like in the preprocessor. So if you're in Michael's presentation, you know the value of having a good name for your repo. So uh, I thought it was kind of good. So Jeff Troll, octothorpe. Uh, conclusions, the processor is a necessary evil. It's often misused or unnecessary, but we can remove, t we can write tools that can remove some usage. We can also write we can also write tools that are more aware of it so that the, the fixes, refactoring tools, and static analysis tools and all that kind of stuff make are more aware of the actual code that us programmers are looking at and dealing with every day. And there's some resources. That's it. So, thank you. Does, does anyone have any questions? Ah, Dave. <laughs> Please. Else no. Uh, so it seems clear to me, like you picked some some nice problems to solve. 
the, the, uh, the policy class transformation, that's, when that gets to the end, that's a pretty impressive thing if it works reliably. Yes, and, yeah. And that's, that's one thing I, I can't tell, I can't quite tell about, especially because I, it's easy for me to imagine things with the preprocessor that there's just no obvious way to refactor in, in a useful way. Like a lot of preprocessor metaprogramming stuff, you could refactor it, but you have to refactor the result of preprocessing it, and then you then you know you lose the the configurability, right? So that's not going to work. Yep. Um, so I'm trying to like figure out where the limits of uh, the have you have you got some sense of like what kinds of problems you can solve with this and what kinds you can't? And that's this is the real question. And how how do you know that you can finish this particular project? Uh, this this part ought to be okay because for the the sorry the question was. Um, <laughs> How um, how general is this? Is that a, a good, a good so like it's how do I know that th that this is actually going to work, um, and is it general enough to sort of handle? Is that the right? Yeah. What yeah. kinds of problems can it, can it handle? What Where kinds of lines? problems can it handle? Um, I don't know. Um, I started this thinking that wow maybe it's actually possible, and so I haven't been like well is it completely general? Maybe that'll be the next thing. There are a few things I've thought of, and then I realized things I could do kind of along the lines of this hack with the lambdas. Like, uh, you know, what if you, de what if you declare something and it's used later, you know? <laughs> like, how, is that, how do you fix that and stuff? Um, I guess time will tell. Yeah. The add-on was, um, it's maybe a matter of, of what kind of patterns you can identify, um, what kinds of things you'll, you'll be able to do. Is that an accurate thing? And, and I think you're right there. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of excited that I could get that far. Um, um, maybe there's more. Yes? So kind of going back to the key string problem, I mean, do you have something in mind there? How do you control for what the movies, if that's are there, because the question was, what can you do um, if the if the if defs are there because things cannot be factored out into a policy? I think we got a good answer actually while we were while we were talking about this because um, we'll just stick all of that stuff into that one if def, you know, if we have to maybe yeah, or something like that. The specialization goes in there as well. So the base class has to be the thing that you think is always going to be there. The base template, excuse me. And the specialization is going to be the one that sometimes is there and sometimes isn't. And you put all the include stuff in there. Maybe that would work. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. I've run over, I think. Thanks very much. This is awesome. <laughs>